how to live a life that defies logic. Repent now. Avoid the rush on judgment day. Most of us hope that our Christian faith will get us headed in the right direction, but that depends on which direction you consider normal. At its core and in its most vibrant expression, Christianity is really well backwards. Think about it. Jesus lived opposite of what common thinking would expect. He was counterintuitive. Not only that, Jesus was consistently counterintuitive. A scripture tells us that God's ways are not our ways. When I read the Gospels, I look at Jesus and say, well, that is not the way I would have done it, and that is not what I would have said. Just say in, in not. Take a look at the parable of the good Samar uh, Samaritan. Instead of making the Jewish religious leaders in, the, he, in his story the good guys, he gives uh, credit to the ar uh, arch enemies of the G Jewish nation. Imagine I am preaching on the University of Texas campus and I tell a story and the he hero of the story is an IG. See the problem? If you are not from Texas, take my word for it. It's bad. The fact is, Jesus sees the world differently than the way the world sees the world. When Jesus was taking a plate as he was being tried by the Romans before his crucifixion, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. Jesus defied logical intuition by the way he lived and what he taught. And what he taught. This is evident in the way we will be rewarded by Jesus when he stand before him at the Bema seat, when each of us believers will be blessed for our role in kingdom work on earth. These rewards come from things that are contrary to ordinary. God doesn't reward us as the world does. So let's look at a few passages in scripture so you can pattern your life around the day, that day instead of this day. Because in relation to our world, our leader is really backwards and yet he asks us to follow him. He really does. He invites us into a radical philosophy that is contrary to ordinary, leading to a journey that goes in the opposite direction of the world. Jesus, your life was unorthodox. I still choose to follow you. As I learn about you, you lived your life in a radically different way from the world. Show me how I can apply your truth to change the way I see the world and change my direction accordingly. Amen. Serving those who can't serve you. God, make me that person my dog thinks I am. A number of years ago, a family showed up at our church with a little boy named Tanne who was autistic. So we put him in one of the Sunday school classes. Suddenly, Paul, the guy in charge of the class, realized Tanne had snuck out. He was mortified, but after brief panic, we found the boy. Uh, the boy. His parents were concerned, and it looked uh, like that could be the last time they came to our congregation. 
but Artin thought about it and told them, We've got a volunteer who would like to minister to your boy one on one, so you guys can come to church together. Would you be okay with that? They look tantly said yes, and that next Sunday they were back, and Tanner was running around our building with Paul running five feet behind him. Sunday after Sunday, Paul continued running off the tunnel. It was the start of something special. The number of such a precious children in our church grew might, uh, mightily uh, each uh, with some, uh, someone to care for them on Sunday so their parents could worship together. I think Jesus and Paul are going to have a great conversation about Tanner at the Bema seat. When Paul stands face to face with Jesus, Paul will be rewarded for the things he allowed Christ to do through him. That's all crazy talk in the world, but that's what the Bema seat is all about. Here's one thing that counts on that day. The B in Bema stands for benevolence. Then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers and or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back and so they, you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the blame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Benevolence is serving someone who cannot serve you back. But when you meet Jesus, he will reward you. Jesus commands those who love the needy, often in quiet ministries that no one sees, and that can't at the beam beam or seat because our world is full of tanners. Son of God, it can be tiring loving on someone who cannot serve you back. Show me where I can pour your love into others like that and give me the strength to do it consistently. Amen. Prayer made perfect. When prayer has become secondary or incidental, it has lost its power. Those who are conspicuously men for a prayer are those who use prayer as they use food or air or light or money. In Ephesians 6, Paul challenges us to pray in the Spirit. That brings up an interesting question, is it possible to pray in the flesh? Could someone actually pray in their own strength as part of a performance-based system to gain favor with God? Absolutely. Remember Jesus coming down on the Pharisees. They were performing for people. They weren't praying. When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, or for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father who is unseen. Instead, Jesus told us to go inside where no one else can see us. But even there, isn't it possible that our prayers are offered as a duty done through self-effort, rather than an intimate occasion to speak with God through His Spirit? Consider again this pure, simpler definition of prayer. 
Prayer is an intimate conversation with one who passionately loves you and lives in you. Prayer is not an action, it's an interaction, and that interaction takes place in and through the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself in intercedes for us through wordless groans. And He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Hallelujah. Prayer isn't something you do. It's something that the Spirit who is in you does through you. We don't even have to use words. In our weakness, we might not even know what to say, but God knows the mind of the Holy Spirit in us. If you enter an intimate conversation with the one who loves you, the Spirit in you will intercede and lead you. Hallelujah. Lord, I surrender myself to you in prayer. Holy Spirit, pray through me. Keep me from praying in the flesh by staying my mind on who I am because of who you are in me. According to your will, lay on my heart at that you want to talk about today. Amen. How to endure when you want to quit? What will people think when they hear that I am a Jesus freak? What will people do when they find out it's true? I don't really care if they label me as a, a Jesus freak. There aren't no disquint the truth. I once heard a story from a missionary about a boy in Iraq, a believer in Jesus. He was pulled off a bus because, of, because he was uh, wearing a cross necklace. He was beaten to a, a park right there on the street. No one stopped them. No one helped him. He later died from his wounds. In the Western world, we don't usually suffer physical pers uh, persecution, but some of you maybe have been fired uh, for your faith. Maybe you have been uh, ostracized by your family. Maybe you've been, you have uh, lost profits, unwilling to cross an ethical line in your business. Maybe you stood for Christ at school and you were ridiculed. ridiculed. All that stuff has uh, to do with endurance and that's something that God rewards. The E in Bema stands for endurance. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and uh, falsely say all kinds of uh, evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Blessed is the one who perseveres on the trail because having stood the test, that, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Amen. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution of ten days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. 
pretty backwards if you ask me. Shouldn't we stand up for ourselves, defend ourselves, pay others back for what they have done? But Jesus says, when it happens, just rejoice knowing one day it's going to be worth it. I am with you and in you. Hang in there, go the distance. Father, give me strength to endure any sort of ridicule or persecution aimed at me because of you. Your love is greater than any insult or injury, and I take solace in your love, a small taste of the rewards you have made for me in heaven. Keep me looking forward and up as I move along in my life. Amen. How to perform an impossible task? Forgive your enemies, it messes with their heads. Our word says, if people are ungrateful or unkind to you, blow them off. Let them have it back. As Christians, we usually don't say that, at least not at church. The M in BMO stands for mercy. If benevolence is serving someone who can't pay you back, mercy is loving someone who won't love you back. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, Let bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your skirt from them. Give to anyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those for whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend them without expecting to get uh, anything back. Then your uh, reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Okay, this isn't just counterintuitive. This is crazy, but following Christ leads us away from the logic of the world. Acting like this requires a divine amount of grace-laced empowerment. And the very same Jesus who calls you to this type of life lives in you. This is the way he wants to live through you. And at the BMR seat, Christ is going to bless you for allowing his mercy to flow through you in a way that brings good things to those who don't deserve it. All right, Jesus, you want to live this way through me. I don't get it. I can't do it, but I am available. Bring to mind my enemy right now. Show me someone specific. I surrender my will to you and ask that you would show me how you speci uh, specifically and tangibly want to love them through me. Amen. Why don't we pray? Sometimes prayer feels like a foreign language. We struggle to do it because it feels well foreign to us. 
but let's look at a few practical day-to-day -day reasons about why we might struggle with prayer. You might recognize a few of these. We don't understand how it works. We might think, if God is completely sovereign, why does he need me to pray? Imagine if during the peak of Michael Jordan's basketball career, his coach sat him on the bench and the team lost every game. After the season, a reporter asks the coach, why did you leave the greatest player of all time on the bench? And the coach answers, well, we don't understand how Michael seems to defy gravity. His competitive edge is beyond our comprehension, but when we fully understand, we will put him in the game. Ridiculous, right? So isn't it equally ridiculous to leave prayer on the bench when it's our most powerful weapon? We are self-sufficient. We might think we don't need prayer. Very few of us would actually say we don't need God, yet we will go on entire day without praying. We have essentially relied on our self-sufficiency and said, I don't need God today. There is a book by Andrew Merritt uh, titled The Believer's Player Life, where he labeled being self-sufficient as sin. When I first read that, I was uncomfortable with it, so I prayed, Lord, it is true that going a whole day without praying in a sinful day. God took me to a passage in 1 Samuel chapter 12, part 19. It tells a story in which the Israelis uh, feared God's wrath because they had been demanding that he gave, give them a king and he was not pleased. So they asked Samuel to pray that God would spare their lives. Samuel's respond, response is important. For be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray, uh, prayer for you. I will teach you the way that is good and right. Samuel understood that failing to pray was sin. We don't draw on his power. We might be trying to pray on our own strength. Prayer becomes frustrating when we try to muster up the time to pray, the desire to pray, and the discipline to pray. Just like everything else we try to do in our flesh, we fall flat on our face. Like absolutely every other aspect of the Christian life, we have got to do prayer in His power. Jude chapter 1 part 20 says, But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Pray is the Holy Spirit. That means you come before God in complete honesty and say, God, if I am absolutely honest with you, I don't want to pray. I don't even have a desire to pray. I don't have this discipline to uh, pray. I need you to give it to me. From this day forward, I want to pray in the Holy Spirit. Why we should pray? The main reason and in truth, the only reason we should need for us to pray is that God wants us to pray. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. But God gives us many more reasons in scripture. Prayer releases God's resources. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. 
for everyone who asks receives he who seeks finds and to him who knocks the door will be opened are you wondering why god's spiritual resources aren't being poured into your life could it be because your prayer life isn't where it made to be prayer gives god pleasure proverbs 15:8 says the lord detests the sacrifice of the wicked but the prayer of the upright pleases him god loves to hear your voice what a thought prayer brings peace to chaos many christians have memorized and called on the philippines for chapter Uh, parts uh, six to seven in difficult times because of God's promise of peace do not be an access about anything but in everything by prayer and petition we thanksgiving present your requests to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus peace is available God wants you to have it how do you get it through prayer and petition with a thankful God Prayer allows you to accomplish what he wants you to accomplish. A passage of a scripture that has meant a lot to me over the years in John chapter 15 uh, verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and in in I in him, he will bear much fruit apart from me you can do nothing what can you do apart from God nada nothing zippo can you do a little bit without him can you do anything of eternal significance without him no prayer keeps you accountable to God in Psalm 139 The author pray, uh, prays earnestly, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and now know my unaccessed thoughts. See if there is any off- offensive weight in me, and lead me in the way of a- everlasting. God's, God is a great accountability partner because he sees absolutely everything you do. You need to go before him occasionally and ask him to show you the soft stuff in your life that you are not even aware of. Just like learning a foreign language, prayer takes time and uh, commitment, but mostly it requires you to surrender yourself to God and ask for his power and for his will to be done. I encourage you to spend some time having daily, honest, and intimate conversations with him. He is waiting for you. Whose approval do you seek? Can't sleep? Come hear a sermon. Come hear a sermon. Jesus defied logical intuition by the way he lived. This is very evident in the way we will be rewarded by Jesus when we stand before him at the Bema seat where believers will be blessed for their role in kingdom work on earth. I don't know if you have seen the theme in these past couple days, but if you haven't, Jesus is going to come right out and say it in Matthew chapter 6. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites 
do in the synagogues and on the street to be honored by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. The A in Bemo stands for audience of one. Jesus gave three specific examples of how uh, secrecy is rewarded, giving prayer and fasting, but it applies to everything. Jesus says we have a choice. We can be praised by people now or we can be rewarded by him then. The actions that elitic uh, elicit people's pray, uh, praise and the actions that elicit Jesus rewards might be totally the same but it is the motive that makes the difference the intent in your heart is what defines your motive make everything you do a thing between you and your father don't flaunt your stuff in front of the world keep it as a secret between you and Abba when your heart is seeking God and only God you are on the right path Father purify my heart that I would be focused on you and you alone as I surrender to you in me if I rely on anyone's approval but yours make it obvious so I can turn that part of my life to you again as I start my secret life with you cultivate our relationship and make it something incredible Amen Are you humble enough yet? Fool me once, shame on you Fool me twice, shame on me Well, non American idiom not always applied I am a quick learner Pain does that to you At least it should A number of years ago our family was at a camp of course there was tons of uh, stuff for us to do so my son and i decided to sign up for a paintball version of the popular children's game capture the flag i figured what could be the harm kids stuff right the left below the whistle and the game started with a rush i saw an opening to get the flag and took off running. <coughs> Sorry. Let the old man show them how it's done, right? <coughs> Sorry. I got at least two and a half steps before seeing George reverberated through my body and I started to fall to the ground. A diary hit an unprotected uh, spot, but that was just this now. In the fraction of the se second it took me to hit the dirt and surrender, every enemy gun on the field turned toward me and unleashed a hailstorm of fire. By the time I limped to the safety of the sideline, the welts were showing up like uh, relatives after you win the lottery. New strategy, forget the flag, get behind this big hunting's tree and stand there. Lesson learned, when you are in a war, having something to shield you from the enemy's missiles is far better than running out in the open. Application, our war is not against flesh uh, and blood. Not even those little zit-faced teens 
who took me out. Our world is a spiritual, and unless we want to take unnecessary shots that could turn us into cowards, we need a shield. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. God is our protector. Faith in him alone shields our souls. I can guarantee you this. If you trust in other stuff, you will feel the pain. Do it again. You will feel the shame. Satan's attack are continual. Each time you run off on your own and take a hit, thank God for his forgiveness and get back to trusting God and protecting yourself with the shield of faith. Father, there are many places I have tried to find protection from evil. There are so many ways I run off on my own seeking my own own glory and riches and open myself up to the attacks of Satan. Ask the Spirit to reveal something specific. Today, right now, I put my faith in you for all my needs. Thank you for saving me from evil as only you can. Amen. We stand firm and strong. It takes tremendous courage to speak the truth in times of opposition. As the early church set out to do as Jesus asked, to be his witnesses throughout the world, they continually faced hostile situations. How, how did they manage to keep at ill even when talking about Jesus became an illegal act. The Bible gives us insight as they teach about God's grace, his plan for victory, and how prayer helps it all unfold. It shows you even how to move from a mundane, mundane prayer life to a vibrant and rich one where you will no longer doubt that God is eagerly awaiting your company and answering your prayers. Experience a rich and vibrant prayer life. Do you ever feel like your prayers are bouncing off the walls instead of landing in the presence of God? Or maybe you pray more out of obligation than relationship, so even as you say the words, you recognize the lack of passion in your voice. You are left wondering if God hears your prayers and more importantly, will he answer them? Arrows aimed at you from within. If you tell the truth, you don't have to remember anything. Satan's arsenal against Christians is immense. His attacks from the outside are pretty obvious, but did you know that one of his favorite and most effective weapons comes from inside the church? There are hundreds of this, uh, decepi deceptive uh, philosophies and false doctrines uh, competing for our attention and may, many of them can come fr uh, from within the church. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. With very little exception, these philosophies and deceptions will distract you from the grace of God and lure you into religious self-effort based on human tradition. It's Satan's favorite ploy, particularly when he can mix in some religion. 
this subtle attack from within the church is nothing more than a set of rules handed down from a purely a human perspective. Jesus warned about this in a big way. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, him hypocrites, as it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. We are taken captive the moment we grasp onto traditional works. People who buy the evil ones' tactics have been uh, diverted from putting their trust in Christ and put their faith in works rather than grace. Do you feel you need to behave a certain way to be accepted by the body of Christ? Do you feel God's acceptance is based on what you do? Inevitably, we need to know where to turn for truth and direction instead of these traditions. God has called his word and his teaching the only completely true philosophy. If you put your trust in Christ and structure your life around his instruction in the Bible, you will head down the right path. God, I know your word is the truth. If there is something in my life based on human tradition that takes away from my devotion to Christ, make it apparent so I can ask for forgiveness and reroute my attentions. Amen.